Hi, I'm Jules Benson, and I am an enthusiastic, which really means slow, uh, cyclist. Um, I would I would love to to race and things, but really just too slow, and I, I enjoy uh, all the other aspects of it too much to give it up. Wait, but enthusiastic doesn't sound like you're slow. <laughs> I think you can be, it's like you can be, you know, I think if you read the old romance novels, there's an enthusiastic suitor, you know, right? Which is the one that like nobody chooses because they're awful. So I think that's how I meant the the enthusiastic part. Did you ever have, did this come, did you have a dream that you did want to compete? No, I mean, I've, I've raced a little bit. So it's funny, I, I didn't get into cycling again, seriously, like every every other terrible middle-aged white man in the, in the country until I was in my pretty mid-30s. So I rode a lot as a kid and I rode mountain bikes and I did a, a couple of small races, but, you know, broke a bunch of bikes and did crazy stuff as you do when you're kids. Um, but really it was my, my, my wife had done a couple of the, um, the multiple cirrhosis, uh, rides in the local Philadelphia area when we lived there. And she, uh, she said, oh, we have to do this. And so I did it one year, I did a hundred and 150 miles in two days wow. on a, on a, on a mountain bike, which was like an average of like 13 miles an hour on these big thick tires. <laughs> and, everyone, <laughs> and everyone looked at me like, you're an idiot. And I was like, no, it's fine. What are you guys talking about? So the next year I got a, a my first like road bike that I'd had since I was a kid. Uh, and it's been it's been both downhill and uphill ever since. Wait, can I ask? That's interesting. Uh, when you when you think about what it is to ride on a mountain bike on the asphalt and sure. then compare that to a road bike, <clears throat> is it just you just feel like you're flying when you get on a road bike? Yeah, it's different. So it's uh, <laughs> so now we're going to get into this already. So um, I want to get into the details. Uh, let's get into it. Super curious. <laughs> Tell me about the knobby tires versus the thin ones. Everything. So the, there's one of the um, one of the things that that we adopt when we become enthusiastic enthusiastic recreational cyclists is the quote unquote you know the speed doesn't matter you know because of course it does but we're too we're too slow to to keep keep up with the fast kids so we say things like yeah I don't mind putting wider tires on because you know I'm just all about the the, the joy of the ride when it's like if I was faster I would have the the fastest tires possible on here to try and keep up with everybody so. Um, there's a whole thing about tires, like this, you know, the, one of the conceits of if you're going, so one of the, one of the things I've really enjoyed getting into in the last few years is, uh, gravel bike, uh, like both racing and riding. So with the roads becoming less and less welcoming, let's say from a cycling point of view, um, you know, the U S has thousands and thousands of miles of amazing, you know, gravel roads, which, you know, if you take, you know, what looks like a regular road bike, but you make the, the clearance for the tires, you know, anywhere from a little bit to a lot wider, then you can put these, you know, bigger, you know, bigger road style tires or even some bigger knoblier tires on these bikes. And it feels like a road bike, but you can go almost anywhere on it. So, you know, there's, there's great gravel races all over the U.S. There's some here in Southern California. And Does it's, it seriously uh, feel like a road bike? Because I'm thinking about just in my little, um, my car, when I'm driving on some of those gravel roads, I feel like I'm not getting traction. When you're out there, do you feel like you're you're catching and you're going? Yeah, sure. But so, so I mean, that's all part of it. So that, that's where I started. So one of the conceits now is that when you're, you know, when you're on a Facebook page or something, you start talking about, a, you know, a gravel bike event, like the, the, the biggest, um, it's not like a noob question, but it's a question that everybody kind of groans at, which is like, you know, what tires are you running? What pressure? And it because it becomes this whole thing of like <laughs> everyone's got their opinion and really it doesn't matter. It's all about you because we all weigh different things and have different bikes and the whole thing. But it becomes this circular conversation that I usually bow off these days. But yeah, you can get like, you know, the, the tires that you think of on a road bike, they're generally historically they're 23 mils wide. Okay. So like if you if you think about the you know the Greg LeMond days of of you know of road racing they were like 21 23 mil tires so now the convention has become that most road bikes now come with clearance for 28 mil tires so a bigger tire means a little bit more cushion a little bit more comfort a little bit more traction um, and then on the the gravel like the the my gravel bike has 48 mil tires okay so you you so when you when you're on these gravel roads, if you've got a 48 mile tire, and you can imagine, you know whatever those laws of physics are that that um, dictate you know pneumatic uh, you know uh, the, the the filling of a tire, you've just got so much more cushion. And so if you run them at, at these softer um, kind of inflations, you can have like a really cushy ride, and you can get over bumps, and you can do a little single track and all this kind of stuff. So. Uh, it's it's so we we dug straight into the technical into the most technical and and I least interesting. 
but it, maybe it's least interesting, but it's interesting to me because I will tell you, for instance, so I play guitar, but I treat my guitar playing exactly like you treat the, the sure. bike stuff, which is I don't want to compete on this. I'm not here to be the best. I'm only doing it for fun. So there's people who go to the guitar center and they buy an $800 guitar. And you sure. know what? They know how to use an $800 guitar. I could play the $800 guitar. It's still going to sound like the guitar I bought years ago. It's not going to sound better. So is in in this case about the tire pressure, the width of the tire, whatever 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 chunks are on it to 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 grab stuff on the ground. Is it super imp- as you've said, is it not really as important as people say unless ex- unless you're competing at the very edge of um, no. So it's I mean I, I think it's probably much like guitars that you you have a you know you have a lot of people who probably can't play guitar that well but if they're in their you know mid 40s and you know they you know now cocaine is no longer in fashion with a certain segment of society so if you have too much money then you get into you know a a hobby so you've got you've got guys who don't you know their their second guitar is a is a classic les paul you know for example so i'm sure you know those guys as well so it's like that with cycling so my you know i i i had a cheapish bike to start with and I leapt straight to a bike that was way beyond my me my capability certainly um and then I've kind of gravitated towards the middle where now I have like a lot of bikes that are either unique or custom in some way and they'll have nice bits on them but it's not really about speed it's more about I enjoy doing this and I've got more into especially COVID COVID has um and I wonder if it's the same for for the the other hobbyists in different areas but I've had to work out a lot of stuff myself because you know uh, you may know that the cycling or bicycle shops have like become extremely busy because more and more people at home I've they've got in they've, they've sold out like there's so many of the of the the regular kind of middle and lower end bicycles where people what say all this time at home why don't I get you know a bike and go with, out with the kids or just take up it as a hobby um, and so bike shops have been inundated as well so I would usually take my bike to the bike shop and say hey can you look at this but now I've spent a lot of time, you know, up to my up to my fingernails in bearings and grease and all this type of stuff. And and it's I'm enjoying it, but it's just time. Like it's, you know, if you if you're working a full time job, um, you know, at the weekend you want to be out doing some riding, but instead I'm spending three or four hours uh, you know, messing around with bearings that I have no idea what I'm doing and hopefully it'll work at the end of it. So um it's, but it's it's satisfying like when you do things yourself. Is that because things broke or because it's fun to buy little fiddly bits and <laughs> Yes, um, there's, uh, there's usually, usually with any of my bikes, and it's funny, I made a Facebook post about this recently, and I said there was, there's like, if anyone who's been in my car or anyone who's ridden with me, like creaking and rattling, like just annoys the hell out of me, I can't abide it. I don't know where it came from. My dad, my dad was a, a really mechanic-y type person as well, and so I think maybe it comes from his kind of, uh, he was a plumber, so he was also very, you know, handy and knew what he was doing with things. Whereas I'm a, a veterinarian and have no idea what I'm doing mechanically. Um, but it's it's become a lot of fun. And I think as I've looked at this, I see, you know, guys, you know, in my age and older, and they become, you know, project car hobbyists, for example. And I, like I get it now. Like there's there's something very satisfying about, you know, working out what's wrong with something and fixing it yourself. And I've always been like. You know, I'd rather at home, like I'd rather do something myself repair wise than pay someone else to do it because I feel like I could work it out if I if I applied myself to it. It's just whether I want to a spend the time doing it and learning how to do it and buying the tools and c there was two things a and b and then c um you know take the risk of really screwing it up and having to pay someone three times as much to come in and fix it. So <laughs> how do you how do you run that calculus? So for instance, I I think. You mentioned COVID. So the pandemic right now probably has changed the calculus. It's harder to get into the bike shop or you can't at all. And so if you want these things done, you have to do them yourself. But yeah. normally, what's your calculus? Is it how much time I'm going to have to spend on it? Is it how much money it might cost me in the end if I screw it up? How do you usually run this? Because it sounds like it might be fun for you if you did dig into it. Yeah. You have some fun. It is time and money, though. So like, and, and, and some of it was fear of screwing it up. But I, one of my good friends is a... Um, an engineer he's a cycling engineer who actually works as a forensic uh cycling um engineer so Whoa. he analyzes um you know what's happened in a bicycle failure and then you know represents either a plaintiff or you know the you know somebody who's trying to sue someone or whatever else so uh he's <laughs> he's a, he's awful for me because he tells me <laughs> he says things like oh it's super easy 
And then I'll go like, okay, <laughs> how hard could it be? And so once I've taken something to pieces and I have no idea, then I'll text him and he says, oh yeah, it's, you know, you'll be fine. And then I put it back on and it's still creaking. So I'm trying to work out what's going on. Um, but I think it does lend itself to that diagnostic process we have in medicine as well, where you're like, you know, what is this thing? What could it be? Let's go through all the differentials that could cause this thing. And of course, as someone who doesn't know everything that's going on with a bicycle, like you don't know a lot of stuff. So you'll fix the things you know about, and then you have to find, okay, what are the things I don't know? And of yeah. course the internet and YouTube has become, you know, massively helpful for, for home projects of all sorts, but cycling is, is no different. But um, yeah, it's, it's, and then the other thing is, you know, if you're not going to the shop, you can justify to yourself, well, you know, I can buy that bearing press from this company because <laughs> I need that because if I'm not going to, and, and it'll pay for itself in right. three years, you know, like it's this whole, the other calculus becomes, well, if I'm not spending money that way, then uh, then I can afford to do this when, of course, you know, it's a complete, you know, fallacy of, of logic. How would you, call, would you say your love of, of cycling and your love of working on the bikes, would you call it obsessive? Or do you, is it not that upset? Is it not? I think it depends who you ask. Um, I think I know people who are more obsessive. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the, the people who are obsessive about the riding part of it and are people who are obsessive about the the acquisition and the 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 toys and that part of it. And I think I probably feel somewhere uh, can fall somewhere in the middle. So I think I you know I I probably don't ride. I know I don't ride as much as I used to. And part of that is just work and circumstance and all that kind of thing, or the excuses we give ourselves. Um, but I'm I, you know I've I've become. You, you curate this level of what is the what is the type of, of cyclist I'm going to be and what bikes do I need to do that and what are the stupid little things that I can add to my bikes and again it's for many people for like racers who do like you know a lot of hill climbing it's all about weight we call those like weight weenies so you know I need <laughs> I need like titanium skewers that are going to drop three grams from the, from the weight <laughs> of my bicycle whereas you know, I'm more on the end of like, at this point, it doesn't really matter. I weigh 200 pounds. Like I'm not racing anyone up anything, but I'd like to have, you know, you know, nice bits and pieces on the bike that either make it look good or sound good or whatever else. So it becomes that whole, you know, the same thing as I'm, you know, with guitarist with, you know, pickups and pedals and all the rest of it, you know, what's the, what's the thing that you want to do that makes the experience a little bit different. How do you, so given the fact that you are busy and maybe there were times where you weren't as busy with the kind of job you have now and you had more time for this, how do you do it in the, in the course of a regular week now, either during the pandemic or before, how do you make time? When does it fit in? How do so, uh, so it's usually weekends at this point or or I'll do something because I, I always feel like if I'm on a conference call, I could just do it during that time, but it never works out like that. So, I mean, a lot of our calls now trying to be, you know, present and all those things, I try and be on video. So I think it would look weird me being, up, you know, my hands covered in grease and a bike and I can't, you know, do this or the other thing for people. Um, so. Uh, it's usually in the in the evening. So even after dinner, like I'll go into, you know, we have a, a kind of a, an old converted garage here and go in there and I'll tinker about for what, what should be five minutes, but turns into, you know, 90 minutes or two hours, depending on how big the, the job ends up being. Uh, and then on weekends, I'll take things to pieces and, you know, work out what's going on. And like I just, you know, I got from I received today, like a bunch of, of picks that look like dental tools, but they're to help get like um bearing gaskets out and all this kind of weird stuff like things that I didn't even know existed before like having to take bikes to pieces so it, I think as a, as a lifelong learner I think if you have any hobby where you get deeper into it the you know the more time you spend on it there's a there's a satisfaction from that as well how did so how did you get started I mean you mentioned you liked to ride bicycles when you were younger but but what is what is your entire historical trajectory when it comes to these two-wheel vehicles uh I don't really know I think that becomes more of a so being in Philadelphia and, and my wife and I moved into the city uh, about well, over 10 years. She was, she'd have been living okay. there before, but when we moved in together, it was about 10 plus years ago. Um, and I started riding bikes. And then, you know, when I got a newer bike, so I started riding on my own just to, just to I think, do something. It's when you're mid-30s and you're like, oh, I should probably do some exercise because I don't really do anything. Um, so it became an exercise thing, I think, really, or just a another you know, a new thing or a different thing. I've never been a runner or anything like that, so I I, I wanted to find something that I could do. And um, you want something you could do outside? You didn't want to spend two hours in the gym. Yeah, I mean, I'd done gym. I think I'd, I I historically I spent a lot more time in the gym, so I'd done like some martial arts and I'd done bits and pieces of this, and I think those things are all great, but they all come with 
schedules and other people and all that type of thing. And I think, yeah. you know, one of the joys about, you know, the, the bike and being outside is that you can either a just be by yourself or be, you know, be very selective about the people that you ride with. Yeah. Um, and, and that became, so, so it became a thing of like, okay, I'll go out and I'll have this route that I'll do. And then I'll, you know, get better by next year by for, for the, yeah, again, the, the MS ride was, was the, was the objective at that point. And, and again, it, you, as you get further into community, you get these, derisive you know sniggers about the you know the quote-unquote ms race of all the you know of all the 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 freds as they call them you know getting their getting on their bikes every year and swarming the bike path to train for the ms race and it, it it's you know it, as with any um clannish uh kind of uh, community you know the there are there are outsiders and then there are those who know and then there are those who really know um and so you know i can i can live without that but certainly i've been guilty of of casting a judgmental eye on on other cyclists which is we we i think we're we're better there's this um there's a community that there was a, it started out as a joke community called the <laughs> the Veluminati. so instead of the illuminati it was the, the 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 cycling illuminati and they had these things called the rules and the rules are that you can only wear white socks up to a certain height and all and it became it was it was started out satirically and facetiously and it became one of those things where um i'm trying to think of what the the parallel might be but oh so for things like um starship troopers where you know it, it's it's a satire on fascism and how you know uh, how war affects people yet the people who really loved the movie were people who thought it was a great war movie like so, yes. you, you, so you get you get some of the you get some of the same things where you know you 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 had people who bought into it and said well i abide by the rules it's like yeah but they're not really like just be it, it comes back to the whole thing that we're all trying to tell each other be kind to each other and don't be don't be a jackass uh, although one of the rules is don't be a jackass, but if you're going to be a jackass, be a funny jackass, which I've always <laughs> found very helpful. <laughs> uh, do you wish, so looking at that, kind of having an appreciation for that culture and seeing it change, do you wish it would become more kind? Are you kind of okay with the way it is? It's, it's a good mixture. Uh, no, I mean, it's tough. So uh, I'm... So I, I've, ridden, I've ridden so much with a lot of different people, and, I, and I, we gravitated towards a, a crew of maybe you know, five to 10 people that I rode with a lot in Philly and you start riding with other people and you see the habits they have and, and you, you appreciate the, or you certainly feel the anger that a lot of people have towards cycling, especially road cycling. But then when you ride with some other people who don't stop for red lights or they don't do this and you, and you, and, and my, my way of doing, I think it's that, you know, that, that servant leadership type thing that we try and practice is like, try and be the type of person that you would like to encounter in a car. So, you know, don't, don't be aggressive. Don't, you know, do, and again, like I, you know, at, at every, every, every stop sign, do I stop if there's nobody there? No, but I'll cruise to it at like, you know, five or 10 miles an hour. If there's no one there, I'll go. Um, but, you know, it's certainly, you know, trying to be courteous, trying to be the type of, the type of rider who is building a, a good community rather than somebody who is challenging and difficult. Not to say that if I get buzzed by a car, you know, 12 inches away that I don't chase after them to the next light and see if I can talk to them. And most of the time, by the time I've got there, I've calmed down and just said, like, can we have a conversation about, you know, what just happened? Because a, you know, the law is, is three feet or four feet, depending on the state you're in. But secondly, I don't know if I've ever been passed at 50 miles an hour by a two ton vehicle when you're on a bicycle, but it's incredibly scary. And I've got, I have got, I've got I want to get home at the end of the day. So I apologize if you need to get somewhere quickly, but you know, there are other people whose lives are, uh, you know, at risk in this situation. So it sounds like you try to have, you try to be understanding about what you would like to see from bicyclists and pedestrians and car car drivers. I find it interesting that you've had these encounters. How do people, how do these drivers respond? Variably. I think okay. some people, I think, I, I think everyone knows they've probably not done the right thing. Okay. Some people, I think will apologize and say, Hey, look, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to other people will know they're wrong and that makes them angry. And so they lash out that way. So I, I think we're all familiar with that kind of, you know, uh, reaction in this, in this political sphere. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I mean, it, it, it runs the gamut. So I think most of the time people would ignore you as well. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I've been in situations where friends have been hit or whatever else. So it's, and I've had friends almost killed and I've known people who've died on the road. So it's, uh, it's a really tough area. And, you know, this, it runs everything from, you know, the, the, you know, bikes shouldn't be on the road if you don't want to take the risk. And, uh, it, you know, again, I, I understand all perspectives, but at the end of the day, let's all just be human beings. It would be, that would be a good start. 
Have you ever had such a bad encounter or almost accident or accident that you almost swore off biking that you thought this is, holy crap, this is so dangerous? No. And I think, um, and there's, and it's funny because there's, the, as you get older, there's that mix between, and, and we don't have kids. So there's, there's, I, I know friends who, when they, when they evaluate the risk of, you know, what is it that I'm doing and is this a reckless activity that, you know, leave yeah. my kids in this situation. So I don't have to take that into account, but certainly, um, it's every you know i think the way i look at it um it's the it's the the post 9 11 don't let the terrorists win type thing i think i think if you if you uh if you if you know what the risks are and i always have lights on the bike front and back and actually the the lights are also cameras so just in case something does happen like i and again i was gonna ask about that yeah and and you know i try and be visible and again all these things you know you you get the the um, the people who refer to like, to people in cars as like cages, like you get the, you know, the, um, the Portlandia, you know, bike rights now type um, <laughs> people who I, I know them as well. Um, but, you know, I think there's this expectation is in, in Ireland, there was a lot of talk about, you know, cyclists must wear high vis and they must do this and they must do that. And it's like, well, you know, what is the responsibility on both sides? There are, there are fine people, as you know, running on both sides of the argument, as as has famously been pointed out. Absolutely. I feel like that. I've heard that phrase a million times in the past four years, just to maintain my own sanity and other people's sanity. And, and around cycling, of course, it is what it is, as it is with everything else. So I just want to make sure that we're, we're using those catchphrases uh, has appropriately. Has cycling always had this jargon? Like you mentioned the Freds. And uh, are, is there these terms that get thrown around? Yeah, I think so. Um, so, uh, the, so cycling also has, you know, from the from the the French tradition, there are, there are a lot of terms around, you know. So even congratulating another cyclist is chapeau, and you know, like, and there's there's the the the, the concept of, of when you get to the top of a big. This is what's always killed me is that like there's this thing when you get to the top of a big hill. You know, you don't ease off the pressure. You go sur la plate. You go on the plate, on the big ring. And I'm like, I'm just holding on for life, dude. Like, I don't know what, I don't know who, who these people are that suddenly say, I found all this energy. And now I'm going to shift into the big ring and blow everyone away. So I assume there are these people because I've seen them on the television on the Tour de France, but um, I'm not one of them. So, but, you know, there's, there's, you know, different types of riders like rollers and punchers and like all these different types. So, so there's, there's a vocabulary that we get from the, the history of cycling. Yes. But then, yeah, there's also, so the you know the the uh, I'm trying to think of you know the weight weenies and you know the 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 mammals of course that we've the middle aged men in lycra that we've picked up for, I think from the UK that came from so yeah there's definitely there's definitely some vocabulary and then of course you know as you get talking about the different you know man this as I'm sure with with the same with guitars there's different pickup types and they have different qualities and what hubs you're using and you know even down to what kind of bearing grease are you using in your hubs to reduce drag and you can get ceramic bearings and like all these different things it just it, it goes on and on and on and you can of course spend all the money in the world if you have it um on on you know the quote unquote marginal gains of getting better faster fitter whatever these things are have you ever had to stop and moderate your spending at any point or how much time you're spending <laughs> no no comment um uh yeah i mean i think it's not it's, that you it's, were going to bankrupt the, the family but <laughs> So, You're just like, holy crap, why am I buying this, all this stuff? So this did get, uh, so recently I just shared this on Facebook, a, a text a text exchange between my wife and I. So we just closed, uh, we, we sold our house in Philadelphia. So we just moved to Southern California. So we sold our house in Philadelphia uh, and we're renting here. So, that, so you know, the, the money from that house cleared and it's in our bank account. And my wife sent me a message saying, do not spend this on a new bike. <laughs> So I was like, uh, I, I didn't really. I mean, I I wouldn't have, but it was uh, it was pretty a call on her part just to just to be explicit in the fact that 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 is not what this money is for. Um, no, I mean, I think you know, and again, there's there's this trickle spending of like there's a thing I need and it's this much and it's fifty dollars and you know, so the, there's definitely a danger of overdoing it when a pair of shoes like can cost six hundred dollars. You know, like it's it, it can get crazy. And again, it comes back to what do you need versus what do you want versus what is reasonable for you in your station in life. Right. So um, none of these things are going to make me go faster. Um, is it nice to have nice things? I guess. Yeah. I mean, as long as you enjoy them for what they are and it doesn't become the you know, the the, the act of acquisition doesn't become, you know, all consuming. Are there ever, I want to ask two things about, you You mentioned that you kind of find these, you can find a group of people, five, 10 people that you can cycle with. And that sounds yeah. like these are people that 
you know, share your values and you like hanging out with them. One possible. So one thing I wanted to ask about, how do conservative American Republicans roll into the cycling community? Because as you mentioned, the fact that it's got sort of this French veneer and it's hooked to the Europeans, the past 10 years, all of a sudden, the conservative Republicans have decided, oh, we don't like the Europeans so much, European this, European that. So how is, does politics ever come tumbling into the cycling world for you? So I'll start in a different area, and I think it will okay. lead into the same thing. So, so one of the things that I really got out of cycling, especially in Philadelphia, was that it introduced you to people you would never meet otherwise. And so some of my best friends now are people who otherwise in life I just never would have met. So, you know, people, um, you know, uh, lawyers and people who work, you know, for, um, you know, uh, video production companies and like, you know, people of all walks of life, people who are, you know, uh, and, and again, just the, the community in Philly. And you can imagine Philly is a very progressive liberal city. Sure. Just the, the awareness of things like LBGTQ plus rights, you know, and, you know, uh, trans rights around cycling and just the vocabulary. So so what what cycling has given to me beyond, you know hopefully you know less pounds accumulated over the years just from <laughs> expending some um what cycling has given to me is much richer than that and it's just this the ability to to meet people from much different walks of life and i think hopefully those of us who are open-minded value that you know um above many other things yeah. um and so you know I, I, when when i got involved in in organizations through work like the the pride veterinary medical community it, it, the the and going back to people who don't have those experiences and perhaps are more conservative, when you start talking about, you know, gender pronouns with people like that, you know, it, it becomes that political correctness gone mad. And it, and to me, it just felt like cycling was a community where how other people felt mattered and you wanted to be involved in that. But I think that's also a, a bit of a bubble of like the people that I knew within cycling, it mattered to them. I think there are, there are definitely people out there who are probably more, um, egocentric i know why well, i know they exist but, and i think you know when you look at the at the you know the lances of the world you know there's this you know we we just watched the the michael jordan documentary the last dance and i think you know we can probably say that you know michael jordan was one of the most phenomenal athletes you know around but he probably wasn't that much fun to be around as a as a, right. as, a as a teammate like he was kind of a jackass in many ways um but i think to 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 succeed to the degree he did sometimes that mindset seems like it's part and parcel of it right and i think there's i think there's definitely you know when you race and when you you know get into that side of it there are people who are the gloves come off and it's all about them and so i think when you when you because there's this it's a crossover between people who are true cyclists and there are people who are triathletes. So, you know, one of the, again, one of the Velominati, you know, you know, facetious rules is that, you know, you shall never swim or run unless, you know, you should, you should never run unless being chased. And, uh, you know, you should never be, uh, you should never swim unless you're, you know, coming off a bike into a lake type thing. So um, I think that there's a place in that community for anybody who wants to be in it. But I think, I think the people who get the most out of it are those who are open to as many as open minded as possible, which I think is, it's, you know, it sounds profound in cycling, but I think it's pretty true of every, every walk of life. Right. So I suspect, so I suspect you are driven. The question I wonder, because you kind of waved off, I decided either I wasn't capable of, I didn't want to enter into that competitive echelon of cycling or are, are there other places of your life where you adopt that ultra competitive, where you have to adopt that, kind of egotistical drive to push yourself forward? Or do you kind of find yourself in arenas where you are not required to do that and that doesn't appeal to you? It doesn't appeal to me. I've never been a particularly competitive or ambitious person. I think I, I've been very, you know, and again, looking back at, you know, whether it's, 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 it, it, as we talk about, you know, the, the, um, the current state of, you know, social justice in the U S and, and I, I, I've, said it a few times just as a way to to point out that you know that this this you know conversation isn't one-sided there is a ridiculous side to to um a, a way of saying that I, as, as an immigrant yes. like there's an immigrant experience which is vastly different to the immigrant experience we're talking about now like and having gone through that process as a white english person you know the the privilege uh, that you're afforded is ridiculous so I think that's my way of saying that I've, I've, I've had 
what feels like a charmed existence. And I think a lot of that comes from the privilege I was given. Having said that, like I didn't come from money. Like my, my father was a plumber and my mother was, was a nurse. And, you know, I, again, talking to someone yesterday, I wouldn't have gone to vet school if I hadn't gone to school in the UK because I didn't have to pay for it. So okay. again, knowing, knowing the, the, the vast differences between my experience growing up and, and what you have here, um, I have some empathy, but certainly not no idea of what it's like to to grow up in a, a skin of another color or anything like that. Um, but I, I've, I guess I've, I feel like I've never had to work. I've always been a hard worker, but I've never felt like I had to stretch myself so far uh, that I feel the need to be ambitious or have sharp elbows or any of that type of thing. I I, I don't think, and I certainly don't feel like I'm somebody who's driven to say I need to be number one in this. I'd rather be a collaborator and be someone who is part of something bigger. Uh, this is the way I felt about it. So, you know, people who've worked with me may disagree. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, we, do one, we can do one of those 360 performances. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, I want to ask how this feels. One thing you mentioned, you were talking about that thing where people talk about when you're heading up the hill, mm. some people talk about this special other gear they've got. What did you say? Yeah. It was on the plate? What was the No, so, so plat is when you, so the, 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 the desire is that when you get to the top of the hill on yes. the, on the, in, in the peloton, then you go solar plat and you go from the small chain ring to the big chain ring and you get uh-huh. you know, and you put on all the pressure so you go on the plate and and yeah so the i've i know phenomenal athletes who are just so so somebody i know actually lives locally uh, he's from wales originally and he did this thing called race across america which is a a one you, you're one person you, you can enter in teams but he went as a solo okay. and you're supported you have a, a car that follows you but they can't help you in any other way except to feed you or to you know to to you know give you medical treatment or whatever else and you ride from oceanside california to annapolis maryland as fast as you can and he did it in like 11 days and it took him like a, a year to recover physically and mentally and to me like that level of that mentality of of chasing something that is so big to me, I'm just like, no, I'm good. Like I'm, I'm very, <laughs> very, I'm very happy. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I know how fortunate I am in my life. Uh, I don't, and I don't know, I'm not saying that there's something missing for him. I think it's just something, you know, it, it feels like that. Why do we climb mountains? Cause they're there type thing. And to me, it's like, okay, that mountain's great, but I'm, I'm probably just gonna, I might go halfway up and take a look around, but uh, I don't need to feel the need to conquer it, I guess. From childhood to now, if you did dip into those worlds with those competitive folks, <clears throat> did, was there ever a time, either as a kid or a teenager or an adult, when you had to wrestle with that thing you just told me, which is, I'm not that kind of person? Did you ever think I'm supposed to be that kind of person? Was there ever any point where you decided, I'm going to push myself hard like this friend I have? He pushes himself so hard, and you tried to be that different kind of person? Um, I don't know. I think when you've done competitive sports or, or sports like um martial arts like so you know doing yeah. muay thai or those types of things i think there's a i think unless you you have that level of natural aggression i think you're always at a disadvantage if you want to go into it from a serious point of view and i think i just known that like that's that's not really who i am yeah so uh, and not uh, you know not a judgment on people who do i just don't think it's in it's i don't think it's my personality so um and maybe that's fear of failure as well so maybe i feel like if i really wanted to compete i would just not do well anyway so my my complacent way of getting around it is to say that's not me so i i, I try not to enter into self analysis too much but i'm aware that, i'm aware that other things exist beyond my own opinion how does it feel how does it feel to cycle so how does it feel to work on the bikes but most importantly what is it like when you go out and you're on the bike what is the emotional thing that keeps you wanting to do it again and again even though some days are hard and some days you know you don't feel like it what pushes it's it's anything you want which i think is what i like about it so i was thinking about i actually thought about this before we had the call because i like you know what is it about it and yeah and i and i think so this week I haven't been feeling great. So I've been going out a couple of times and I've just like tootled around and I've, you know, gone down to the ocean and, you know, yesterday I went, you know, and, and you know, took some pictures uh, of the sunrise and the week before that I felt good. So I was doing some, you know, some of the hills in the area and pushing myself as hard as I could and, and caught myself, you know, grinning through the pain type thing, which I think <laughs> if, if you're, if you're, because the, the suffering is a big part of it, the, the masochism, um, 
it's it's joked about um but i think there is that definitely that thing of like sometimes you feel the need to it's not flagellation so much as it is how how hard can i go and how much can i push myself yes. and i think i think the bike allows you to do that to do as much or as little as you want um and and i think the the variety of things you can do with it so i i have you know a variety of bikes for different things but you know what i like about you know having the gravel bike for example is i can sell from home and i can go 50 miles and i can do some road and i can go into crystal coast state park and do like some crazy trails and like all on the same thing and all on the same day and just see really cool stuff and you know and you know wave to people and chat and and it, it just it feels very it, it it and i don't i'm not someone who who has a an outlet in terms of you know uh, meditation but it feels i think it's very meditative even if you're with other people sometimes i think there's just something about that the cadence of turning the pedals and knowing that's all you have to do um i think that's a it's a it's a it's a nice place to be are, are you ever do you ever have a bad ride because you're thinking too much about work like are you ever not able to turn off and you can't enter whatever that zone is that you need on that bike that day i don't think so i mean i think there's always the I, I, um i think one of the other nice things is that you don't have you know it's not like being in the gym or going for a run where, you know, you have your phone there or there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, a, a, um, an opportunity to glance at something because you, you, you do have to focus on, you know, the, the balance thing hopefully comes after a while, otherwise you're going to be in trouble, but the, <laughs> just the general looking around and being aware, and I'm not as someone who rides with headphones. I, I, I resist that because I think the, not just from a safety point of view, but also just the experience of being out in the world, just trying to be, uh, to take it in, um, and the you know the the wind in your ears all that crap but i think um i think there is something to cutting yourself off and so i, I will i will have thoughts about work and and it will help clarify my thinking on some things but i'm also quite good at, at uh, i think you know there's there's this conceit that you know women ask men what they're thinking and we say nothing and they think we're lying and it's like no we're just thinking about nothing like there's there's just nothing going on in there um and i think that's i think that that's the case a lot of time when i'm cycling and i, I don't find that you know, I come out of this reverie with all the answers to all the questions I need, but it certainly makes a big difference to my mental health during the day. I notice that when I ride, when, I, when I've had weeks that I can't ride, it really makes a difference. Um, and my health as well. So I wear, you know, a, a, a device that, you know, tells me what my heart rate through the day and my heart rate variability and my sleep quality and all those types of things. And, and it makes a huge difference if I'm riding. And I don't know how much that is physical versus how much is psychological, but um, I don't know that it's, that it makes a, that it's worth trying to separate them. Yeah. What do, that's interesting. You said, you know, uh, maybe women wonder what guys are thinking and sometimes they're not thinking anything. What do people think about when you tell them uh, that you cycle, what, what, what reaction do you get? If you're at a cocktail part and like a work cocktail party or hanging out with relatives, how do people react to your saying, yeah, I, I ride, I ride my bicycle a lot. So I do want to say that I don't, I don't like that gen, that gendered opinion. And I feel bad that I said it, but I, it's a conceit that exists. So I was just using I, it as an example. So I just want to say, yes, I okay. completely understand. So, um, but when I say for a second, so there's usually the the best thing that happens is that they they say I cycle too, <laughs> and then you can start showing people. Wait, do they whisper it, or do they? It, it, it? It's it's a little bit of both because it, depending on how obsessive you are. Like I remember meeting um, somebody who's become a good friend, but in the in veterinary medicine, and we started talking about it, and you know started showing pictures of our bikes. Like it becomes that sad, um, and and you make a real connection, um, but. When you tell people, so last year I did a, uh, a gravel race in Iceland, which was um, 125 miles, um, and it's this it's this amazing blasted rock landscape. You know, it looks like the surface and the moon, um, and it's it was just you know a phenomenal experience. Uh, and when you tell people things like that, they're like, okay. And, and I think there's just this you know, unless you have the same enthusiasm about something else, and I think endurance uh, sports are different because you do have that. You know, that was 10 hours, 10 hours of like suffering and you don't know why you do it, but the euphoria and the memory is just so sweet. And there's this concept of, have you heard of the types of fun? There's type, type one, type two A and type two B and type three fun. Um, and so type one fun is like, he's having fun. Type type two A fun is like, you, you're having fun, but it, it, there's some periods of discomfort. Yeah. Uh, and type type two B fun is like, this is really painful. I don't really know why I did it, but I I know that I'm going to enjoy it afterwards. And type three fun is like, you you might die. 
you literally might die with type three fun. Um, but it will be the best stories you've ever had. So there's these, these, these various types of fun that are recorded. So type three fun is what we're always aiming for. Um, but the, but the, 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 the dopamine effect and all those things you get from endurance exercise, I think it's, it's, it can be hell while you're in it, but just the memory of it and just the things you take from it and the relationships and all those things is just, um, uh, you know, you, you can't. So, so when you talk to people about this, <laughs> I'm talking to you now and you're like not a cycling person. So you're like, what's this guy talking about? But I, I, I think everyone can relate to it in some way. It's just whether I think there is a special relationship between people who've done type type three fun stuff, because I think it just gives you that special bond. So it's always nice to find people who have that. I think you're right. And I think we talked, you know, you talked a, a while back about people who have kids and they think about the mm -hmm. risk. Oftentimes for some people, the only way to get type three fun is to they there's always some risk. I mean, when you're going fast on a Sure. bicycle you could always but in the extreme cases it's people who go off by themselves into the ocean or mm -hmm. people who go off by themselves up a mountain those are the people who are in extreme cases yep. of of danger yep. um, and this sounds like it sort of you know skirts that line and never has to like wander into the risk and danger category yeah i think you're right and i think this you, you do take that into account so when you you know when you're bombing down a a gravel road at 50 miles an hour that you've never been down before um, I think that you skirt the line between recklessness, stupidity, and, you know, uh, just completely turning your brain off. Um, but there's, there's, it's, uh, the, the danger part, and I think, I think, and I know I have really good friends who are like, I don't, I can't go fast because I just don't like it. It doesn't appeal to me. Um, and it's not like it's, it's, for me, it doesn't feel like it's a, a um, an adrenaline seeking thing and maybe it is and maybe you get addicted to that as well but it just feels it feels very freeing to you know and, and everyone you know there's i can't remember who, what the, who the quote was but you know um you know going fast on a bicycle feels the, the closest thing you get to flying right so i think there's that aspect of um you know when 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 man and machine are unified and you have this you know amazing experience of just and so if you have a great day on the bike and you're feeling good um there's not much that, that compares to that it's a it's a it's a pretty good feeling has there ever been a time, um, so when you're, maybe not when you're cycling with a group or maybe, yes, uh, where you did feel in danger or you're like, I went too fast or I shouldn't be by myself right now, or you fell and you're like, oh crap, I really hurt myself. Oh, I've, I've fallen off a lot. I mean, so I, I'm, <laughs> I think one of the, so there's always skin missing somewhere or there was for okay. a long time and, and I haven't, I honestly touched wood, haven't fallen for a while. Um, but I think, um, there's the there was that concept in the I think it was the 90s like the no fear thing of like you know if you if you don't fall off you're not trying hard enough and yeah. if you don't if you don't live on the edge you're taking up too much room and all that kind of like you know toxic masculinity stuff but it's um I think I think the risk taking aspect I don't I, I don't think about it as risk taking I think about it as an accepted risk because you know you're going to go out there and something might happen so out here in Orange County people get airlifted out fairly frequently around the you know the, the some of the mountain bike trails which especially in the time of COVID I'm sure they feel terrible about it um, but um, I think it's just one of those things where you hopefully ride to the limits of your ability and and you know as you float with those things things can go horribly wrong or mechanically things can go wrong or whatever else um but i guess i've, I've probably slowed down i'm a little more sedate than i used to be just because i know that you know at the end of the day yeah i think it's one of these concepts when you talk about masters racing so masters racing is usually 40 or 40 plus okay and and it, it tends to be it can be less aggressive and less competitive in many ways just because it's like at the end of the day guys we all have to get up on monday morning and go to work like you know nobody needs a broken collarbone or a broken wrist you know let's all just go out there and have some fun and compete and of course there'll always be you know a few people who are the type a competitive athletes who want to win at all costs um but i think generally speaking like i think we we, we all we all understand what the risks are and hopefully we we deal with them in our own ways but um you know you'll get some people who who that's just not enough and they need to go as as fast as possible and as, uh, to the edge as much as possible and that's cool too it's it's not not my style but to uh, each their own you said you had a you said you had a number of number of bikes uh do you need a lot of bikes to are are any of them nostalgia bikes or are they bikes that are really for specific things and every year you use them for one of those things where how did you build your inventory so it, it becomes uh so I, I started out with um 
start out with with a very basic like road bike and that's fine and you can do most things on that and actually a lot of the gravel rides you can do on road bikes and all this type of thing but then you get to the point where it's like okay well this is the thing i want to do next and so i think for my 30 something birthday i bought myself a, a a new carbon bike and so the materials of bicycles are basically aluminium or aluminum as you say incorrectly <laughs> um steel titanium carbon okay so carbon is is you know what what the Tour de France bicycles are made of these days, and and it's a, a it's a material that's very stiff. You can put out a lot of power. It's somewhat compliant, and and so, um, and if you want to go fast, probably carbon is the best material because the tubes can be shaped and all this kind of thing. You can get air, you know, aerodynamic tubing and all this kind of thing, and they put it in the wind tunnel, and it's amazing. And it, it you know, you can buy a twelve thousand dollar bike with, you know, the most amazing weave of carbon, etc. So right. However, as you get further, and this is the nice thing about being a, a slow rider, is you you start to, to say things like, well, you know, steel and titanium have a much higher ride quality, you know, and you start to, you start to have these conversations. <laughs> and so uh, I, I have... I have a couple of titanium bikes that I'm uh, that I, I like a lot because titanium does have a very special ride quality, and then you start getting into the really snotty areas of like different types of steel. So I have like a couple of steel bikes that have you know different you know 853 versus you know um, uh, spirit for lugs, like all these crazy names that some of these <laughs> that these types of steel have, and they all have different qualities and different builders do different things with the way they lay them up and weld them or braze them and all. So the the inf the infinite ways you can put a bike together and the materials you can make it out of yeah. like they all do different things so like tom ritchie was one of the original guys who started making bikes um out in the bay area originally and tom ritchie i don't know what he does but the way he puts steel bikes together is just he makes incredible bikes and of course he doesn't do it himself anymore but the company you know still makes incredible bikes and then you get down to the the custom bike builders and i have i only have one bike that's been built for me but i have several bikes that were custom built for other people that fit me yeah. Um, and so I have, you know, a gravel bike, I have a, a road bike, uh, with disc brakes and I have a road bike with regular brakes. And then I have a single speed cross bike. So cyclocross is another thing. And then I have a mountain bike, which is a, just a hard tail mountain bike, which means it has just the suspension fork on the front. So those are the five bikes that I use pretty much mostly at the moment. So I have a couple of others that are in states of disrepair and my wife and I have a tandem that we don't ride very often. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, I've, I've pared down. I, I, at one point, I've had like nine or more bikes, I think. So I've, I've got a, a coterie of like bikes that suit my needs at the moment. I'm really happy with everything they do, and I'm always replacing bits and pieces on them or tinkering with them or whatever else. So um, it's, uh, it's again, uh, just recognizing the privilege of the of the, the nice hobby that I have um, and the, 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 the fact that I'm able to spend time and money on it is, uh, is a nice thing. It, it feels like cycling because the because the cost of bikes can be so high compared to like if you want to play tennis or basketball, sure. you need a racket and a ball or just a ball. So there's a little more of an inventory outlay. If Has anybody ever come to you and said, hey, I'm thinking about getting into cycling. Tell me what I should do. Or has anybody ever said, hey, I just need an exercise thing. What do you think? Should I cycle? Yeah. What, what do you tell what how do you tell people when you give them their first advice or how do they what should they do to get started? So I, I think there, there's, you know, for, for cycling generally, like you can buy and it's and it sounds like, you know, you say things like you can buy a nice bike for a thousand dollars. Like that's not a lot of money, but it is a lot of money. It is. Right. But you can also buy. So I, a, a good friend of mine, um, I just built a bike for her out of one of them. Actually, the first bike that I, I bought when I got into cycling, this aluminium uh, Cannondale. And I put the bike together for her because she was looking for a bike. She wanted to get something that was you know, lighter than the one she had at the moment. And it ended up, you know, the dimensions working out that, that we were, you know, um, similarly proportioned. So I put it to put a bike together for her and it's, it's basic and it's rim brake and it doesn't have great wheels, but like it's a, it's, it's light years away from what she had. So I think yeah. you can, I think there's so much. Uh, and, and to be honest, I, most of the time I'll tell people to buy used because I think there's, if, if you have someone who's willing to help you and to watch out for the right thing for you and to know what a bike, you know, safely should look like when it goes on the road, yeah. I think that's a great option. I think if people don't have that capability, there is a definite safety and value um, from going to a bike shop and buying something pretty basic. But the, the level of technology these days is so incredible. Like you can buy a really low end like road bike and have an amazing bike like it's just this the trickle down technology that's emerged in the last you know 10 or 15 years you don't have to spend a lot to get a really really capable you know um safe and and fun bike 
And is it really is the issue primarily if someone is going to get off the road and sidewalk and they're going to go on to any other rougher terrain or in your in your estimation, you'd hate to go to like super. Super, I'm just super target or, or Dick's mm-hmm. sporting goods and buy a bike there. It just seems like ah, it might not be there. It might not be good enough. And then, you know. I think the, the biggest issue that I've seen from, from big box stores and bikes yeah. is, is that they're put together by people who are not cycling professionals. So I think, okay. I think I've, I've seen massive safety issues. Like, you know, and, and I've stopped people on the trail a couple of times and said, you know, who put this together for you? Cause the fork is the wrong way around. You know, like there's, <laughs> there's some, or, or the brakes are in the wrong place. Like there's some fairly basic stuff that goes wrong with these things. Um, so I, I do think, and, and, and like everything else, like the local bike shop is really struggling. You know, I think the COVID has given it a shot in the arm in many ways, yeah. but you know, with the availability of, you know, parts on Amazon and, and again, people who, who are able to do their own thing as much as possible, um, you know, the same as veterinary medicine, the same as, you know, you know, the local record shop, you know, all these things, bike shops are really under pressure. So if you have a local bike shop and if you're, you know, if you want to get a new bike, um, it, but also bike shops, you know, they, they are their own worst enemy sometimes and they can be snotty and, you know, they can see people as, you know, not cyclists. Um, and I think you should always, if you, if you get that air from a, from a bike shop, you should just walk out and find somewhere else. And they should, it's, it's an inclusive sport and everyone should be, should feel free to, to be included. You mentioned a little, so, I mean, we, we only barely touched on gender with your nice comment saying, ah, I'm just throwing that cliche out there, but <laughs> sure. I don't want to, I'm not sticking to it. I come I come out of uh, sci-fi and comic book stuff yep. and sexism is rampant in there. Just lots of dudes with, you know, sometimes they have social awkwardness. Sometimes they're just snippy personalities, but sure. they make comic shops and sci-fi conventions sometimes a difficult experience for female fans. Is it, how is cycling gender? I mean, how is it gendered? How, and like in these bike shops, are, are people typically open to women coming in? And So they should be um, okay. because I think, I think more and more, and, and I think you're absolutely right. So, so generally speaking, there's been some of the same snotty attitudes and some of the same issues around professional cycling is still massively um, unequal um, in terms of prize money, in terms of coverage. And again, there's that circular argument of, well, sponsors aren't going to pay for women's events. And it's like, well, you know, how did the, the, the US women's soccer team do? And like, again, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things like if you, if you, if you build it, they will come type things. Yeah. Um, and I think it's hard. And I think, I think there's a, um, I think the, the bro-ish attitude certainly does exist in cycling as well. But I think there are programs, again, especially in Philadelphia, there was a really good uh, Women Bike PHL, which was a development program for women to get into cycling mm-hmm. of all levels. So I think I think there's more and more uh, recognition that um, women want to do this and can do it. And again, I think there's this there's this broish thing. There's this thing of getting, quote unquote, chicked where a woman, you know, on a bike passes you. And I'm like, I, I know so many, I know so <laughs> many. I know, seriously. So I know so many fast and capable women riders that it's. Um, you know, it, to me, if you, I'll try and catch people, but like, it, it's, it's not because it's not because you're a woman on a bike. It's because like, <laughs> I'm just trying to try to go faster. Um, but I, I, I think it's, um, we have, we also have a massive diversity problem. It's worth pointing out as well. So I think from a, uh, it, it is another one of those domains of the, of the white male. Um, yeah. and I think cycling is doing better, but we can always do much better. So I think there's, there's some great, um, resources and if anyone's interested looking into it there's, there's great people like uh celine yeager who um is a, a has been riding and writing about bicycles for a long time and she has a lot of good things to say about how uh women in the sport uh can and uh, access and all those types of things right on um my my last question only sort of is a tangential to that one which is thinking about how people help each other in the sport who supports you in a given year or in the decades you've done this? Who who helps you do this? Or is it mostly sometimes when I talk to people about the thing they do, it's a it's a solitary activity that really relies on just them. Do you see this as do you see cycling as a solitary thing or that you get a lot of support from other people and other people are necessary to make it happen? It can be both. Uh, I mean, I think since moving to a new place in the middle of covid um, and, and really not not supposed to be doing any activities like that right. to, together. You're not supposed to be riding together in groups unless you, you know, you're, you live with those people. Um, but there was definitely when I had a group of people in Philly that I rode with a lot, there's definitely that co-motivation attitude of, 
I've agreed to meet this person at this time to, to go on this ride, so I can't just blow it off. I think there's there's a lot of that kind of certainly for me for the type type of motivation I need. Yeah. Um. So I, I've I've always found that that you know the the people I ride with a lot can be really motivational to to me not just getting out but being better as well. So I think I think certainly. Um, and again, in a friendly way, I mean, as much as, um, you know, when I was riding with one of my, you know, good female friends and like Lauren started beating me up the hills, I'm like, oh God, like, you know, there's that whole thing is again, not because Lauren's female, but because like, <laughs> right. I was always like, I used to beat her up the hill. So you, you always know it's, it becomes a, a yardstick to help measure you as well. So it was, uh, <laughs> it's, it's always good, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think it, it can be a really great social sport. Um, but I think one of the joys is that you really can just go out on your own all day and get lost um, in your own company if you like that. It sounds so flexible. It's so fascinating here that one week you push yourself hard on the hills yeah. and the next week it just it feels like the bike is a tool for you and the bike is not something that's sort of dragging you along like sort of this weird I have to do this and it becomes another should. It sounds like you adjust it day to day, week to week, depending on how you're feeling and what you need. So I do. And I think I think but I think if you're a. I think this is one of the problems that pro athletes have with cycling is that the the bike becomes a a, a tool of pain and uh, and of um you know kind of you you can grow to hate it I think so yes. I think I, I'm I'm somewhat careful like I've been I've had training plans before and I've you know testing your numbers and all the rest of it and and I think there's a huge amount of value and if you want to be competitive that's definitely the way to go but there is the danger of then it becomes a chore. Um, and I think a lot of people in my position who, you know, we're not competing at the, any level. So to be able to make the bike, as you said, the tool you want it to be, you know, how you want it to be. It's it's great to have goals. And yeah. I think we should all have that. But I don't think, you know, using it as a tool of, of personal punishment um, is it's for me. It's not the way I look at it. But again, I think it can be it can be that tool for you if you want it to be or it can just be someone thing to get you down to the shops. And I think that is, you know, that is one of the joys of, of you know, in life on two wheels is that it, it really can be, you know, whatever you need it to be. There is that perennial issue with anything you really love about how much mm. do you want to turn it into a career and yep. how much do you want to turn it into a hyper competitive thing that you're pushing yourself on? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Like your guitar playing. I mean, I, you know, I assume you're, I assume next is super stardom. So I mean, <laughs> this, this will become... <laughs> Um, you know, one of the one of the the seminal Spinal Tap type, you know, flashbacks. I assume. Absolutely. I assume when they come back and comb through my history, they'll find this recording and they'll think, "What did Jules his cycling somehow tied into his work at the time? He wrote those songs. Why did that happen?" And they'll exactly. Dig into it. Exactly. Well, uh, Jules, I really appreciate this. I learned a ton about uh, bicycles and bicycling, and I didn't know anything about this stuff beforehand other than, you know, just having a bicycle sitting around and not using it. So I really appreciate your taking the time. It's been awesome. Thanks, man. I, and I appreciate it. Again, I think this is, as with everything, it's you get out of it what you put into it. And I think if you, if you hopefully if you put in a, a positive and inclusive mindset, like I think any sport, but certainly cycling can be a great thing. Uh, this is uh, Jules Benson, and he is an enthusiastic cyclist.